financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughning. You're listening to the Vaughning Podcast. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... I'm Jason. All right, since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, this podcast and everything found on the website is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. Uh, so as you can tell, Kyle is not back with me uh, as of yet. I actually haven't heard from him in a few weeks. I hope he's okay. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what's going on there, but, uh, instead I'm pleased to have on Jason Booth, uh, as our guest co for this episode. Uh, so welcome to the podcast, Jason. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Shane. How about yourself, man? I'm doing quite well. I'm doing quite well. Can't, uh, can't complain too much. And, uh, you know, I don't really think uh, anyone would want to hear it anyways. So, uh, let's not, uh, you know, take a valuable, uh, airspace here or airtime, I guess. Uh, with uh, with that, so so Jason, uh, first off, I want to thank you so much for uh, thank you publicly for uh, all you're doing, uh, you know, to help us spread Vanu. Uh, so for those don't, that don't know, Jason is a, a meme a meme machine, literally. Uh, he's made probably at this point like 25 or 30 memes for us uh, for uh, of Rayo's words. Uh, so he's helping us, uh, you know, reach more people on fascist book, uh, which we certainly appreciate. And he's also, you know, this is I, I even value this value this more. Uh, is uh, he's done quite a bit of uh, proofreading work for us. Uh, you know, in the process of digitizing these highly valuable uh, and insightful libertarian publications, uh, some articles of which we'll, uh, you know, read today. So, Jason, thanks so much, uh, you know, publicly. You know, I want to make sure, you know, uh, the, the listeners know uh, who's helping us, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Hey, you know what, man? Honestly, I, I do it because I love it, because I love the idea of Vanu, and I love this idea of limiting coercion. Like, I want to be free, and anything that helps me be free, I will I will help make it Make it popular, right? On. More, you know, as as Danilo says, "Rising tide raises all boats." Yes, it does, and you know, I've got a soft spot for boat for boat references, so I appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate that. So before we, you know, get it, get into it too much, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I know you're you're very very you know interested in the idea of Vanu. Uh, so so I guess uh, since discovering it, I mean, what effect has it had on your thinking thus far? I mean, have you? Uh, I mean, what are, are there any steps you're taking, uh, you know, to implement Vanu in your life? Uh, you know, uh, has it has it changed uh, your thinking philosophically? I mean, could you speak to that? Uh, it very much has changed my mind philosophically. Um, I, I I was I was what I what I call an uh, anarcho capitalist or or free market capitalist or or whatever term people want to use, uh, voluntarist. And um, I was I was one of those guys that that was just like. If we could get enough people to think this way, we could end the state. We could do this. We could do that. Well, my mentality on that, my, my thought process, my goal has changed. And instead of instead of collectivizing freedom, I seek freedom for myself, and I s- encourage others to seek freedom for themselves. Yes, you know, yes, that's 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 great. That's great to hear. And uh, you know, I, I mean, something something I've said often is, I mean, if, if you're going to wait around for you know others to, if you're going to wait around for a free society uh, for to be free, uh, then you might as well just you know expect to be a slave, uh, you know, throughout your entire existence. And that's uh, not uh, what I want to do, right? Uh, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to wait on others. I want to uh, you know take the initiative myself uh, and increasing my personal freedom. Absolutely. <laughs> if if you wait on anybody for anything in this world, you're gonna wait a long, long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And and, and I'm, I'm actually kind of right there with you on the anarcho capitalism thing. I mean, I do I do still have. Uh, I did an episode on Liberty Under Attack with uh, my with my uh, co-host over there, uh, Jason Paradise, uh, on Rayo's uh, article against social reformism, which is from the same publication. We'll we'll get to here in a moment. But uh, he's got some pretty hard. He's he's been very you know kind of vehemently uh, against uh, any sort of collective movementism, and he kind of groups anarcho-capitalists in with that. And from and from your explanation of it, I mean that's that's kind of how I was too. Uh, it really was. It was you know if we can just you know prove the efficacy of the free market, uh, then you know then you know people want to privatize everything, and you know we'll, we'll abolish the state, and everything will just be uh, will be uh, rainbows and unicorns. And uh, unfortunately, that's not how the world works. And uh, social change and reformism movements often tend to, uh, you know, uh, I guess as as Rayo kind of said, uh, you know, the, the the state that we have now uh, is pretty much a result of you know failed political crusades of the past. So, 
And even though, you know, anarcho-capitalism, you know, really shouldn't be, you know, political crusading, uh, unfortunately, that's in there, which, uh, you know, as he was right with, right about with uh, movements again, I mean, uh, they become, uh, <laughs> they, they, they drastically, uh, you know, descend far away from their original goal. And now you have uh, anarcho-capitalists arguing for closed borders and you have uh, anarcho-capitalists uh, advocating for uh, some really, really nefarious stuff that we really don't need to get into here. But uh, it's just another, another, uh, you know, another uh, I guess not, I don't know the, the best way to put it, uh, just a, another favor or another, uh, more evidence in favor that Ray was correct. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I personally, I like to call these movements fireworks because there's, there's a lot of buildup. Ooh, ah, ah, boom, they explode and they're all bright and pretty. And then they fizzle and die. Every, it happens every single time. Occupy, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, the alt-right, all, they're, they're just, they're going to fizzle and die. None of them are actually going to accomplish what they initially uh what they what they initially set out to accomplish because yeah. because the the people that run the government they will they will never have a public face they will never be elected they will never run for office so. yes yeah that's uh that's that that's definitely true uh that's that's definitely true so um, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's good to hear. You know, I, 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 I guess one of, one of the, one of the best things I like to hear about, uh, you know, people who listen to the Vani podcast is, uh, or, you know, hell, Liberty Under Attack too. I mean, we're, we're very vehemently against political crusading over there too, but, uh, it's, it's the, uh, you know, folks that, uh, you know, reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, I was a uh, controlled schizophrenic for a while. Thanks for bringing me out of that. Uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> glad, glad to help. <laughs> glad to help, uh, you know, uh, get those, uh, collectivist spooks uh, out of your head. I think that's a, a, wor a worthwhile effort. Uh, you know, when not uh, not not social change, uh, of course, but you know, uh, you know, impact, you know, uh, influence, in influencing, you know, uh, you know, the select few people that I can uh, through this podcast. So, uh, I guess is, is there anything else you'd like to, you know, uh, I guess talk about there as far as, uh, you know, um, what I guess uh, are there any strategies you're pursuing, uh, you know, as far as Bonnie? Uh, nothing that I want to state publicly because those sort of things are still illegal here in the state of California. Okay, well, I, I certainly appreciate that security culture. Just figured, uh, I figured I'd, I'd go ahead and toss that out there. So, so there's, there's some, there's some strategy there. I like that. I like that. Uh, and that, that's kind of the same way. I'm, I'm not going to go public with, uh, with, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that, uh, uh that no. I'm doing either. So, uh, all right. So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, get into it here. So this episode is titled Vonnie Week, a week in the wilderness. And the show notes can be found at vonniepodcast.com forward slash intermission seven. So before receiving Vonnie Book Two. Uh, which you can pick up for free as of, I think, two days ago, maybe. Uh, I think two days ago, and this is being recorded on uh, September 13th. Uh, we had, you know, very little information on uh, Vonnie Week. Uh, we had a firsthand experience from Benjamin Best, uh, and that's about it. That's, that's about it. We didn't have a whole lot of other information on it. Uh, but if you do want to pick up that uh, Vonnie book, too, just go to vonniepodcast.com forward slash Vonnie, too, uh, if you want to follow along with us as we take a dive into these publications. But uh, this new publication has provided much more insight into Vonnie Week, uh, which is the subject of discussion tonight. So we'll be reading and discussing six articles uh, and guides from the aforementioned publication in order to get a better feel uh, for what participants would have expected and experienced uh, when at Rayon Roberta's Vonnie Week. So this uh, very well might be one of our longer episodes. I'm not really sure. Uh, we'll just uh, we'll just have to see. So I guess any other thoughts before we get into it, Jason? No, let's get into it. All right. So uh, so last night when we were we were talking about you know getting this uh, getting this uh, old podcast going, uh, you told me that uh, you used to live in the region where uh, you know Ray and Roberta spent uh, a lot of their time, uh, which would be the Siski region. So would you mind provi providing us with uh, some insight, uh, you know, on that area? And, uh, you know, uh, make sure to touch on those details uh, uh, that you talked about regarding uh, marijuana. Because I know Ray with a pothead would, would certainly appreciate that. <laughs> and, guys, <clears throat> I, the, the Ray, Ray being a pothead, that comes from Brian Doherty, his uh, Radicals for Capitalism. There was, a, there was an anecdotal story in there uh, about, uh, you know, Ray, uh, you know, in his underground, uh, his underground structure, you know, rolling doobies up for visitors. So, I mean, that's just one source. I don't know if that was actually the case. He also did talk about growing pot in a couple of episodes in this publication. Uh, or in a couple of articles in this publication, but uh, but anyways, let's let's uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, and, and speak to, and speak to that here for a moment? <laughs> okay, uh, okay, Ray, Ray was smoking pot like it is a huge cash crop, uh, but the the area of uh, that Rayo uh, uh, talks about the the Siskiyou region, right? It's it's the uh, Kalamath Siskiyou eco region, quote unquote, and it's um, northern California, coastal into southern Oregon. And it is a absolute botanical godsend. It was it was one of the few areas not covered by ice under the uh, during the last ice age. 
right? So so it was a island for for animals for for fauna. Huh. Um, and it, it cover it covers roughly a million or eleven million acres, right? So that this is this is a large region it, from the the Pacific Ocean, uh, from the northern area of the Napa wine country up into the southern end of the western Cascades, Cascades in Oregon, uh, and ex- extends as far over east as Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen. Um, and we're, we're not we're not talking like hills here. We're talking mountains, like up to 9,000 feet, 10,000 feet. Shasta's 14,000. Wow. Um, but even, even today, I mean, this rail was there 40 years ago. So even today, it's still considered one of the wildest regions on the west coast it is it is largely unexplored there are not many roads uh and the few roads that are there are mainly logging roads um but as, as for as for growing marijuana as you as you asked about humboldt county <laughs> if, if you if you know anything about about cannabis you know about humboldt county um <laughs> it, it is it is it is very, very popular there. It is a cash crop. They call the area the Emerald Triangle, uh, Mendocino, Humboldt, uh, Siskiyou counties. Uh, it's everywhere. It's it's literally and figuratively everywhere. I mean, there are huge plots, people growing. Um, it grows the majority of the medical cannabis on the West Coast, and it also grows the majority of the recreational cannabis that you will find uh, on the West Coast. Um, and when I say it's everywhere, <laughs> I, uh, I lived there 20 years ago. I lived there for two years, about 20 years ago. And we would be hiking along, and there's plants. There's plants growing wildly on the sides of people's houses. There were plants growing through the concrete, through through the cracks in the concrete, like... <laughs> Like like seeds had dropped and germinated in the little dirt in the crack of the sidewalk and started growing. So instead of, <laughs> so instead of having you know weeds growing up you know through little cracks in concrete, you had weed growing up through you know cracks in concrete. <laughs> yeah, we weed is the greatest weed uh, that you will ever find, and yes, it is it is literally everywhere. Okay, interesting, interesting. So was that was that the case? Uh, you know, when when you, so you mentioned, yeah, you were you were, you were back there. I guess uh, when I turn back over to you, let tell tell the listeners a little about a little bit about uh, what you did there and uh, when when you lived there. Um, but was it kind of uh, similar? You know, uh, uh, you know, 40 years ago, was it still kind of uh, you know uh, that pervasive uh, in that area? Because uh, you know, Rayo did talk about uh, crypto culture. You know, small little uh, patches of uh, you know marijuana growing out there in the Siskiyou. Uh, I'm not sure if you ever did that, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to to find out. But uh, could you speak to those? Uh, I am not that old. I can't tell you what it was like back there in the 70s. But right, right, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I do know people that live in the area uh, that were that did move there in the 70s. They were counterculture. They were hippies. They were. Uh, you know the, the the quote rainbow people, uh, and they move there for the privacy, for the ability to grow good bud, um, and to be left alone. There there is there's not a lot of government in the area. There's not there's not many large cities. I think I think the largest city in in the area is Eureka, uh, and. I would be hard pressed to say that that is more than sixty thousand people. Um, the where, where I where I lived in Del Norte County, which is the northernmost county on the California coast, the entire county was only thirteen thousand people, uh, mm-hmm. and it was a it was a good sized county. I mean, we're not talking like you know, ten square miles here. No, we're talking like hundreds of square miles. So the population density was very, I guess, very low. Then I think it would be the right way to put it. Yeah. Uh, when when I was there, it was very low. Uh, when Rail was there, it was it was even less. So huh. he he he, li- he could not have picked a better spot to uh, to live to to practice his to practice his uh, um, limiting coercion. 
Right. Yeah. And, you know, Ray, Ray was a smart dude, and he did talk about uh, there was a chapter in Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, the first book, uh, which you can get at tinyurl.com forward slash Vanu Rayo, uh, where he did, he did, there was a, a chapter called a, a Survey of the Siski Region. So he didn't choose that uh, location willy nilly. Uh, there was also another location he favored, and he wrote about a little bit, uh, Bella Coola, British Columbia, uh, which is also an, a unique location, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a moment. But he didn't just choose these locations randomly. I mean, they were very, it was, it was very, very deliberate. And uh, he, he had a goal in mind, and uh, I would say he largely achieved that goal, uh, you know, especially with choosing the region. Uh, yeah, it, it <laughs> for what Rail wanted, for the privacy, to, to be off the grid, to be hidden, uh, for good water, uh, for a lot of foraging foods, um, British Columbia and, and the, the Siskiyou region – he, he could not have picked better. It's there, there's there's simply he, he could not have picked better. There's no large cities, there's no airports, there's no military bases, um, there's no large universities, um, there's no large highways passing through the area. Um, <laughs> like 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 right. and, the, and the military bases that was huge to him. He was very fearful of the nuclear you know nu uh, nuclear war. Uh, so. Yeah, that's probably another reason, too. You know, there's no military bases nearby. There's nothing for them to nuke unless they want to nuke just wilderness, which they're not going to do. Well, hell, you know, I, I don't put anything past the state. Uh, I, I really don't. But uh, I, I would say the, the chances of them, you know, just nuking, you know, uh, Siskiyou region, just a Siskiyou forest, I think are probably pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is where they filmed the famous Bigfoot video. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. Uh, Will Willow Creek, California, the, the famous Bigfoot video where... Bigfoot is seen walking across, uh, and he looks at the camera. Uh, that was filmed on, on uh, near Willow Creek, which is on 299 between Redding and Arcata. Uh, Redding, Redding, California, and, and Arcata in Humboldt County. Interesting. Very interesting. So, so is there anything else you want to mention about uh, Siskiyou? Because if not, I'm gonna, you know, dive in here to Bella Coola real briefly, just from you know looking at a map, uh, uh, you know, reasons why why Rhea would prefer that spot. But anything else there? Uh, no, not really. It's, uh, it pretty much speaks for itself. I mean, just Google the area. Just look at the pictures. You know, the, the, the mountains are tall. The valleys are deep. The water runs cold. There's lots of food. The, um, the summers are warm. Uh, the winters are not bad. It's, uh, it really is some of the most beautiful country that I've ever experienced. Yeah, I need I need to make a trip out there at some point. You know, I I want to yeah I want to you know go experience it firsthand. But I, I don't really you know have any other reason to you know make it up to uh, uh, Northern California and Southern Oregon. Hey, there's, there's really not much there. The redwoods, Shane. Go stand go stand in the canopy under the canopy of the redwoods. It will change your life. Really? Huh? Okay. A absolutely. All right. Well, I'll, I'll have to do that. I'll have to do that. But uh, okay. So Bella Coola, British Columbia, was the other location that Rayo kind of referenced here. Well, he mentioned British Columbia, and then I'll, I kind of uh, you know got the second portion of that information from Erwin Strauss's How to Start Your Own Country. Uh, but so to give you an idea here, Bella Bella, uh, Bella Coola, British Columbia, it's uh, on the western, you know, the pretty much the far western portion of uh, of, of Canada. And it's a really interesting location. So there's uh, there's inlets that go from the Pacific Ocean into Bella Coola. So for someone who was pursuing uh, minimal sailboating, uh, they could combine that with van nomadism, or not van nomadism. They could combine that with wilderness fauna very easily. I mean, you can drive, you know, you can you know take a boat right up those inlets, I imagine. And you know, barring anything, any you know natural you know things, I'm not aware that I'm, I'm not aware of since I've never been there. But a very very unique area. And if you look at some pictures of uh, the Bella Coola region. Uh, it looks pretty similar to, uh, you know, the Siskiyou region, I would say. Uh, so there's uh, yeah, not not really a coincidence that he favored he favored this location too. Oh, absolutely. The uh, both areas are are technically temperate rainforest. Uh, they they do receive a good amount of rain, uh, a, a good amount of moisture. I'm sorry, not necessarily rain because there is a lot of fog associated with with the moisture in these areas. Um, and and they like like I said, both regions offer the privacy. I mean, they they are largely unpopulated. Right, and I think with Bella Coola, like there's uh, obviously you know when they're like there's there's ports and things. I don't know how far away from kind of the Bella Coola region or yeah from the Bella Coola region it is, but it looks pretty far. It looks like it'd be a uh, and I don't think you could actually drive there either. I think you'd have to go like back into these areas like via boat. 
Uh, I highly doubt there's a lot of roads back there, probably logging ones uh, like with Siskiyou, but uh, I imagine with, with a lot of these locations, uh, you know, in Bella Coolie, you'd pretty much have to just, you know, uh, travel there by boat. I don't think there's any other possible way. Uh, so, I mean, that that's another, you know, in, in favor of, uh, you know, uh, if someone's, you know, hiking up in that area, you know, uh, something's wrong. <laughs> if someone just, you know, ends up walking up on you, uh, you know, something's probably wrong. I doubt it's a very uh, traversed area. Oh, it, absolutely not. It's um, both both regions have what rail was looking for, right? They they offer they offer the privacy. There's no large roads, no military, no large cities, no no large ports, no uh, no real government uh, infrastructure, no real government involvement. They they are they are largely. I almost want to call them like a, a a limited coercion zone. Yeah, very very easy for one directional isolationism and, and import export. Uh, I mean, it, it's very very easy to uh, I guess put a put a partition between uh, your your Vanu home base uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, even when you're traveling outside of that, even even some of those towns like Grants Pass, I imagine those are still uh, you know similar uh, similar terrain. So uh, you know for import export, I think that'd be uh, another uh, you know another mark in favor of. Uh, of the region as well, but uh, anything else on the regions, or uh, uh, should we uh, get into uh, Vani Week? Uh, no, I didn't really have anything else. I think I'm pretty much good. Okay, so uh, so again, this is from Vani Book Two. It's uh, I've retitled it Vani: The Search for Personal Freedom, uh, Number Two: Letters from Rayo. Uh, you can pick that up at vonnypodcast.com forward slash vonnie2 if you want to follow along with us. We'll be starting on page 33 uh, of the PDF. And as always, I'll, I'll, I'll read some portions and then we'll pro I'll stop and, uh, and, and we'll discuss. So uh, this first one, uh, Vonnie Week 19, uh, this is uh, Vonnie Week uh, 1972. So this uh, starting here, and this is uh, Jim Stum speaking for this first sentence. Quote, the following ad appeared in Vonnie Life 6, March 1972. And here's Rayo speaking, quote, Live and learn wilderness Vanu living for six days in Siskiyou region this summer. We'll show you how, help you, scout, site, erect shelter, finesse trails, forage wild foods, eat inexpensive whole grains, cook invisibly, store supplies, cache valuables, 15 hours personal instruction, demonstration, assistance. We furnish campsite, tents, mosquito bar, ground pad, cooking gear, food, mostly wheat, beans, and rice, lamp, saws, lamp, Okay. Uh, saws, books, maps, and catalogs from our library. You bring clothes, bedding, any personal items such as snake bite kit, camera, binoculars, firearms, extras we can furnish, extra charge, bedding, local transportation, vehicle parking, help setting up permanent shelter. Continuing on here. Your campsite will be forested, uh, will be in forested low mountain area, swimming hole in Clear Creek, less than half mile away, moderately secluded, over a mile from near settlement. We are still learning too, but maybe we can advance you in your quest. Uh, one or two people, $40. Additional people uh, in group, $10 each. Additional days, $1 per person. Sorry, no animals. 20% deposit. Say when and how you will, will arrive at least a month in advance. We'll send directions to the meeting place. Uh, so, uh, end quote there. Uh, and Jim Stum, we'll pick it up here uh, back where this is Jim Stum again. Quote, the following letters were sent to the first Vani Week customer, not to me. This, this one's called Letter from Rayo, April 16th, 1972. Uh, and this is Rayo speaking, quote, Thank you for a reservation for Vanu Week and $10 deposit. May 30th or 31st is fine. Please set exact time and day for meeting you, if possible, so that you don't have a long wait. Any time is okay with us, but meeting place will be easier for you to locate in daylight. Since I haven't seen you for several years, please also provide identifying information, information such as color of shirt, pants, vehicle, which can be seen uh, from a distance. Encloses a, pre a preliminary description, also directions to meeting place. Within a week, or, a week or so, you should also receive further information about Rialtoville, which you ought to have. Consider the typical program to be illustrative only. Look at it, then tell us what you want. Let us know you and your companions' relative interest and seclusion, comfort, vehicle access, how far you're willing to hike, access to swimming hole big enough to actually swim in, not just dip in, weather is often very hot in June, 90 degrees to 100 degree highs, distant scenery, view, nearby terrain, some fairly level, grassy areas, rather than all trees and brush, Foraging wild plants. Berries probably, probably won't be ripe. Hunting and trapping. We are not very proficient at this. Sad to confess. But I had, I had two mice for breakfast along with a pot of sprouted wheat and beans. A year ago, my reaction was ick when I had to remove one from a trap, showing that attitudes can and do change. Continuing forward, it'll teach you how to, quote, cache valuables, stash uh, bulky commodities, self-mobile human shelter, a base camp, 
relatively stationary human shelter, uh, smile or shoe swap, import export techniques to be techniques applicable to northwest coast, uh, rainforest techniques applicable to interior, techniques useful mainly for summer, techniques useful for the year round, foods you dislike, etc. Will female companion be free mate, potential free mates? How important is comfort and recreation potential for her? Is one tent, one double bed foundation adequate? Of course, you can tell us what you want when you arrive, but we can prepare and do a better job if we know in advance. Uh, so I'll just stop there. Uh, I mean, they're going to teach you a lot of stuff. <laughs> Lots of stuff. Pretty much everything you need to know. Uh, multiple types of shelter, uh, even. So, you, you know, the, uh, the, the base camps, which I imagine would be more so kind of like the play athlete tents. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the more, uh, stationary ones, the smile and the shoe swap. And if you've never looked at a shoe swap dwelling, I hate that word. It's so hard to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, just do a quick Google search. They're, they're interesting little, uh, they're, they're kind of like the, um, like the Indian tents they used to have. They're kind of round at the bottom and then they get uh, skinny at the top. But, uh, I think Rayo's adaptation of that was that he actually dug into the ground a little bit. Um, so a portion of the shoe swap dwelling was uh, underground. So what well, interesting, you know, I guess development on shelter there. But uh, what do you think so far, Jason? Uh, it sounds like a Vanu crash course. Um, a lot of a lot of what Vanu or what Vanu, a, a lot of the things that Rail was talking about there are are basic survivalism skills, right? How how to build a shelter, you know, uh, where to get water, what to forage, what to eat, how to eat it, how to cook, how to how to hide your fire. Uh, and these are all skills that are very, very valuable at, at maintaining your invisibility, right? To to protect yourself from the uh, from being exposed to to the outside world, from from you know the government or from other uh, from other people knowing that you're there. I, I think right. I think that was I think that was the point. Um, that of, of this whole Vanu week is is to teach people how to live uh, as invisible to the servile society as possible. Right. That, that's 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 exactly right. And I think also too, um, I don't know this for sure. We'll, we'll, we'll this will be revealed, uh, you know, later on. I think uh, yeah, the Vanu uh, Vanu week, uh, you know, review or whatever that uh, uh, whatever that uh, article is called that we'll, we'll get to momentarily. Apparently, there are only two groups. Of people in in uh, 1972 that participated in Vanu Week, oh, one of those being Benjamin Best, which was later in the year, uh, and I'm not sure who the other one was for 1972. But uh, I think also one of the other reasons people would attend Vanu Week is people that were interested in the region already, and they wanted to actually you know go out there and live and not be you know out on their ass by themselves, right? Uh, they wanted someone there that's uh, you know has lived there for uh, at this point uh, you know 1972 probably you know 10 plus years. So uh, he's very, uh, him and Roberto are very, very familiar with the region. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, you know, uh, going there to, uh, you know, learn the region and also, you know, get some, get some advice from people who actually, you know, live there. Oh, absolutely. Um, you can read a lot of things in a book, you know, I, that reading, reading things in a book helps you, but until you actually get there and put your hands on it, what you read doesn't necessarily correlate into skills. Right. right. What 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 Rayu and and Roberta here were offering was the hands on portion of the education. Right. You know, that's, exactly. You know, and and what better what better person to learn it from than someone that lives it? You know, it's it's like learning logging from a logger. You know, or or that's fishing right. from a fish or fishing from a fisherman. Right. I mean, you you can learn fishing from TV. But it's not the same as learning it from someone that actually fishes. No, no, it's it's much like uh, you know uh, when when uh, uh, when uh, my dad, my brother, and I uh, went up to uh, Canada to to go fishing. I mean, we all knew how to fish, but uh, but we actually yeah we we got a guide, you know, someone who you know lives there and just takes people on you know fishing tours, you know, just as 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 a guide. And uh, you know we would have been uh, uh, we we didn't know the area obviously. Uh, he took us to all the spots where you know the biggest pike were. So. Uh, you know, I, I certainly, you know, understand why people would go learn from Rayo. I mean, I, hell, I would, you know, go learn from Rayo if, uh, if, if he was still alive. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, get back into this real quick, and there'll be plenty more to discuss. Quote, the area I have in mind for Vani Week is accessible, only a few miles access road unpaved, but not especially secluded. While we have never been molested camping there, several months total at various times, several vehicles per day drive through, also distant highway noises are audible, which might be disconcerting for someone, companion, question mark, who might subconsciously equate Vani with absence of man sounds. 
So let us know how far you prefer to hike, especially on rocky, brushy terrain without trail. We would like to wrap with you about strategy, BC, British Columbia versus Siskiyou in general, etc. And if you would also, uh, and, and if you would also, don't consider this to be part of the 15 hours. End quote. So that's the. I think that might be the only time Rayo mentioned British Columbia. He might have mentioned it in Bonnie Book One, and maybe again in this in this publication. But I don't remember offhand. Um, but uh, but yeah, British Columbia uh, was in another place that uh, uh, that uh, that he obviously preferred, as, as we kind of already talked about. Uh, yeah, uh, one quick point I wanted to make here is uh, he mentions highway noise. Uh, he also mentions later in, in, in what you're going to read it eventually when you get to it. Uh, he mentions uh, mailing things to Grants Pass, Cave Junction, and uh, O'Brien. Uh, O'Brien. You started looking at the maps too, didn't you? <laughs> uh, I I knew where I knew where it was. <laughs> okay, <laughs> through, fair enough. Through the. Uh, O'Brien is on Highway 199. Um, 199 runs from Crescent City to Grants Pass, Oregon, uh, which is it. O'Brien is only about 10 or 15 miles north of the California border uh, in extreme southern Oregon, uh, and this this would be the northern edge, the the northern the northern third of the Siski region. Okay, so we, we've got we've got a, a pretty good a pretty good you know uh, um, idea of exactly where he was then. So that's that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Uh, hell, I might uh, you know uh, ask you after the show if you want to if uh, you want to get a map of the region and kind of uh, you know put that uh, I'll, I'll put it as the uh, show image for this episode. Uh, if, uh, if you would uh, you know give us an idea of exactly you know where that is, because I think it'd be good for the listeners to know. Like Siski region, as you said, was is huge, absolutely huge. So uh, eleven million eleven million acres. Right, right. So yeah, we'll have a more a more precise uh, idea of where he was. And yeah, I, I I noticed that too. I was like, okay, Grants Pass, uh, Cave Junction. So I was looking at the map trying to figure out, but I wasn't familiar with the region. So I said, okay, so he was somewhere in this area, maybe. Uh, not really sure, but the highway information uh, is, is definitely definitely helps here. So, uh, let's uh, let's get back into it. Uh, quote: Possible hazards: poison oak, ticks, rattlesnakes. Uh, the four ticks, which have so far managed to bite us, apparently didn't transmit any disease. We have seen throughout Siskiyou in two years four rattlesnakes. Killed two, ate one. So uh, let's move on to this uh, another letter from Rayo uh, regarding Vani Week to the same uh, participant. Quote, Consider the availability of the camper and bedding to be a first customer discount. We will be identifying and correcting problems in our proceedings. Two other people have made deposits, but won't be coming until August. I request that L or whoever have a fairly good understanding of our motives and goals, Vaniwism, before arriving. If she reads the first six issues of Vani Life before coming, then discusses it with you on the way, this should be sufficient. I will assume that whoever comes understands in general what we are talking about. If she doesn't, she'll think we are very weird people. And indirectly, you must be weird for wanting to come, etc. Also, I'll assume she is discreet regardless of the particulars of her philosophy. Uh, end quote. So I'll stop there. That's, <laughs> you know, that's a very good recommendation. You know, uh, you tell, uh, like, I can imagine, you know, someone saying, uh, oh, you know, I'm going on a camping trip this weekend. You want to come? Oh, sure. That sounds great. Showing up there, you know, in the middle of, you know, the Siski, you know, wilderness. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Rayo comes out and builds you a polyethylene A-10, shows you how to do it. And uh, she's sitting there, you know, just twiddling, like, you know, I guess just kind of, you know, pondering, what I get myself into? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I could, I could just imagine her not knowing and just be like, where's the bathroom? <laughs> right? Yeah. Where, where, where's the outhouse? Oh, it's it's that tree over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys have running water out here? Where, where am I supposed to take a shower? Uh, you can go <laughs> creek about a half mile over that way. You can go take a dip later if you want to. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah wa wa watch out for the poison oak on your way down. Yeah, if you run across any bears, just let me know. <laughs> oh, yeah. you'll know. You'll know. You'll know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, watch the rattlesnakes. Yeah, yeah. So that's... I, I can understand that recommendation, and I, although I imagine if anyone you know is corresponding with Rayo, they're 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 keen to that information. But uh, you know, some things you know, some things are kind of needless to say. But you know, that's probably a pretty important one, especially you know whatever her philosophy is, just make sure she's discreet. Uh, <laughs> you know, gotta gotta put put forth that uh, extra layer of security culture, I suppose. So uh, let's go ahead and get uh, back into. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You got something? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, Rayo Rayo was all about. Limiting his exposure to to the servile society, right? Living, limiting his exposure to the coercion, and to bring in somebody is a huge step for him. Um, th this is a guy that likes his privacy. To to bring somebody in, it's it risks it puts his his lifestyle at risk because you know all it takes is is 
is one slip of the tongue and you know the government could be like oh hey who's this guy living out in the woods so right. he, you you need somebody that you know is very discreet and and won't talk and won't the the people that came in for Von a week had to want to be there right i mean it's not it's not they, they they didn't just you know find this information on you know like a Google search or something you know they <laughs> no they, definitely they, not they they sought out Rayo right they sought out this information they sought out this lifestyle yes yes that's uh, yeah that that is uh, that is very very true and you said something there that sparked a uh, okay yeah that there it was there it was so um, so yeah obviously you know to bring in bring in other people to the area does uh, you know make him more vulnerable at least uh, in some sense but. Um, he did not take the people to his base camp or any of his base camps. Um, so that's, so he had that extra layer there too. It's like, okay, they know I'm in this, in this area, but what are they going to do? You know, scour the forest for me. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're, I don't think they're going to do that. But, uh, Benjamin Best had an interesting experience. Uh, he actually went back to the van, uh, with Roberta and Rayo. So, um, you know, they, Rayo liked uh, him him enough to where I think, I think he'd met Benjamin Best before. Uh, so that might've, uh, you know, had something, some, some sort of factor into it, but, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, Benjamin Best actually got to go back to the uh, to the van uh, into their base camp. So uh, so yeah, generally you know the people that came uh, you know probably didn't you know, get to, get to know exactly where Rayo was. So uh, so that's uh, just just another point there. But uh, let's go ahead and finish up this this uh, the rest of this article, and we'll get into uh, uh, an interesting description of Vani Week by Tom and Roberta. Quote: Food we provide will be mostly vegetable. We are not as much into hunting and trapping as we would like to be and intend to be in another year. If you have time, you might try to visit R.P. near Eugene. He has lived around rural areas of the region for 50 years. But unless you contemplate moving to Siskiyou, you might do better to get further advice from someone in the locale of interest to you, since possibilities vary considerably from area to area. Since you didn't specify miles to base camp, I am picking a fairly accessible spot, about half a mile from camper or one mile from original meeting place. But you will be near the edge of a large wilderness relatively, and you can hike in as far as you want. End quote. So... Interesting. I mean, I mean, yeah. Well, wherever you want to put up your polyethylene planets, I'm sure Ray would be fine. You know, further away, probably, uh, you know, better for him, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, he, as as we talked about a, a second ago, the the, the privacy, uh, limiting the coercion, all that. He needs a buffer zone, right? To to uh, a buffer zone being the distance between him and where he's taking these people. Um. And and he he's he also mentions a a large wilderness area, right? You you quote you will be on the edge of a large wilderness area. The O'Brien area, uh, as we talked about, is the southern end of the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest, uh, and the north end of the Klamath National Forest. Uh, both very 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 large wilderness areas. Right, right, yeah, and I would recommend for the listeners who are, uh, you know, listening to us, you know, I, I, I sometimes wish we did a video podcast uh, here, but uh, that would just create, you know, so much more work, but uh, I, I hate to not give you a visual here, so I'd recommend you go into Google and just type in Siski region and kind of take a look at, uh, uh, you know, some of the pictures from the region. It's it's absolutely beautiful, it really is, uh, and also give you, a, you know, a, a visual of, uh, of the area that Ray was talking about here, so... Uh, let's start getting into this next one here. I think we're going to have more frequent stops because this is where things kind of get a little interesting. But uh, it's called Vani Week Preliminary Description, April 1972, again by Tom and Roberta. Quote, uh, introduction, Vani Week provides a sample of our present way of life and 15 hours in our techniques. We are living in a low mountain area of the Siski region. Winters are long and wet but mild, mostly rain, little snow. Summers are hot and dry, but there are many creeks that flow year-round. Many of our techniques, especially for shelter, are useful only in this climate. They would not be suitable in desert, Arctic, or regions of heavy snowfall, including northeast and north central U.S. I'll stop there for a moment just to add in a, a little uh, little detail here. You know, when I was reading John Fisher, he, he was the editor of Ray's first book. He There was a chapter in his book about, you know, inhabiting like an, an, an iceberg, you know, in, the, in Antarctica. And... Uh, <laughs> I saw. I was like, okay, John, that's a, you, no one's no one's gonna do that. I mean, you're you're stretching a little bit here, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm putting I'm you know actually I finished digitizing it today. Uh, Ocean Freedom Notes, and I would say there are, you know, uh, uh, quite a few public quite a few articles in there uh, talking about you know how to uh, you know inhabit icebergs. So uh, you know he wasn't you know just kind of tossing it out there like it's not it's just not gonna work there. I mean, that was something I was heavily discussed in those publications, which kind of blows my mind a little bit, uh, you know, even up to the 1990s. But you don't hear you don't hear talk about that anymore. You just don't. 
Oh, no, it, it, it's blowing my mind just to, to hear about it right now. Uh, the idea that you could sustain yourself on an iceberg absolutely baffles me. Well, hell, they were talking, they were, they were, they're, you know, theorizing about, okay, you know, this structure might work. Here's how you would, uh, you know, you'd use hydroelectric. Uh, you'd have all the fresh water you need, obviously. Uh, because I get one thing I learned was icebergs are, uh, uh, they're fresh water. They aren't seawater or they aren't salt water. Uh, so there's your little tidbit of uh, information, as long as, uh, you know, the source is accurate. I think it is. I have no reason. The, the Jim Stum was, uh, I kind of, uh, in last week's episode, I kind of said, well, he must not have been, uh, you know, too sharp. He is sharp. Uh, very much like the engineer mindset of Rayo. So uh, and some of the some of the things he, I guess, theorized, like, uh, you know, some of the ways for electricity or how to, uh, um, you know, how to, I guess, mine water from icebergs and then to sell it to, uh, he was talking about selling iceberg, selling uh, fresh water to California back in, uh, uh, back in the, uh, back in the eighties. <laughs> and uh, I doubt he realized how, uh, well, actually he, he did realize it, which is why he wrote about it, but uh, they could use some of that fresh water now. So for any of you entrepreneurs out there, uh, you know, uh, make sure to pick up a copy of Ocean Freedom Notes when it's available. He gives you a nice little way to, uh, uh, a way to, uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, mine icebergs for fresh water. So, uh, you know, California could use it. I can, I am, I can assure you of that. And that's crazy, right? They're right on the ocean. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have desalinization plants sitting off the coast that were built during the last drought, and then we got a lot of rain, so they were never instituted. And then by the time we were in drought again, the um, the plant had broken down and they had to rebuild the plant. Oh, man. Yep. Yay, politics. California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's not, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, when like, a, you've got to be kidding me. It's the state. I mean, what can you expect? But not funny when people are, uh, uh, when I think they, they actually, uh, you know, did kind of... Um, uh, water rationing too, right? Like uh, I think they were talking, like, like there was a big fuss about uh, you know sprinkler systems. I think if I remember correctly, you know a few years back, uh, was that is that, is that correct? Oh, um, year before last, there were I want to say, uh, where was I? I was like I want to say it was like seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars in fines handed out uh, for people watering their lawns on the wrong day. And then, and then on top of that, there were state or there were there were cities that have laws against brown lawns, right? So, so you had to ration water, but then if your lawn got brown from you rationing it, the city would fine you. <laughs> oh, it's 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 too hilarious. It, it doesn't even sound real, but uh, you know, it, it's I live I live in California. Oh, it man. is real. It is real. <laughs> Um, so, so what do you do if, if you know the, uh, the the you know the city ordinances you know uh, uh, you know uh, contradict the uh, you know the the state law? I mean that's that's a little uh, a little strange, but uh, uh, but yeah, I guess the, the long and short of that of, of that little digression was uh, uh, yeah, entrepreneurs you want to you know sell sell uh, fresh water to uh, California. I think he mentioned uh, some of the Arabic regions too because uh, of the population explosion that that he 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 mentioned a population explosion. I don't know if it's true or not, but there are uh, here are entrepreneurial entrepreneurial opportunities. Uh, you know, for uh, for mining icebergs. But let's get back to it. Quote, our present shelter and techniques as of April 1972, after a year and a half of experimentation and development, is adequate or better from April uh, through November, marginal from December through March. When daytime temperatures are below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is often the case in winter, we are comfortable lounging in bed on one hand or doing strenuous work on the other, but not when doing light work that requires standing or sitting. Our highest priority right now is the further development of shelter, and by next winter, we expect to have adequate year-round shelter. However, during Vani Week, we'll demonstrate present and not anticipated methods, since new approaches invariably have problems that are discovered and corrected only through experience. Uh, emphasis. We are living almost full-time in the wilderness, not merely surviving until we can return to civilization. Our objective is not maximum self-sufficiency as such, but maximum Vanu, invulnerability to coercion with comfort. We use whatever mix of imports and native uh, native materials uh, that will yield maximum Vanu given our present skills and numbers." End quote. So, referring back to last week's episode, so Jim Jim Stone put this publication together, and uh, <laughs> and uh, there was uh, in his uh, anecdotal experience, he said that uh, you know Rayo's uh, you know uh, uh, Rayo's back glass shattered, and uh, uh, you know he required Rayo required you know uh, materials from the Serval Society. Vanu doesn't work, and uh, he he's like you and you can't uh, you like there. You can become self-sufficient to a point, but uh, I mean, what is he going to do? Start manufacturing glass? 
Uh, like, it was a really disingenuous, you know, critique. And he put this publication together, and this is what Rayo says. He says, our objective is not maximum self-sufficiency as such, but maximum volume and vulnerability to coercion with comfort. We use whatever mix of imports and native materials uh, that will yield maximum volume. So, uh, yeah, you know, Jim Stump should have been, uh, you know, more, uh, I don't know. I, I have a J Jeremy Hangler kind of point. He's like, it sounds like he sounds like a scorn lover, uh, which I, I think that's that might be the case. He wasn't he was not being fair with Rayo. Uh, but what do you think? <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I agree complete with, with Jeremy's assessment there. And uh, uh, replacing the back, replacing the glass would be limiting your limiting your coercion. Right. I mean, if you're driving down the road and you have no back window, well, a cop's going to see that and go, hey, what's going on? You know, that's that's especially today. It, yeah. It, that that's exposing yourself to the coercion, uh, and and you also mentioned um, uh, uh, maximizing um, maximizing the the vanu right that it all that explains why why bleh, why Rayu didn't build like a log cabin, right? Yeah. You you can't you can't move a log cabin. No, right? but you, you can move a van. I mean that's kind of the point, right? It's got uh, four wheels and an engine, it's supposed to you know be mobile. <laughs> uh, yeah, not only that, it, it also explains why his shelters were largely temporary. Exactly. Exactly. So, so yeah, that critique, I mean, you know, imp that's why Rayo developed the concept of import-export. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that yeah, so he wasn't seeking max, he wasn't seeking uh, self-sufficiency per se. I mean, obviously, the more thing, uh, obviously, his goal was to, you know, become as self-sufficient as possible. That wasn't, the, that wasn't kind of the... Uh, that wasn't the the end goal. The end goal was uh, invulnerability to coercion, or becoming as invulnerable to coercion uh, as you possibly can. So, uh, let's go ahead and get back to it. This, these next couple paragraphs are, are interesting here. Uh, quote: We admire any survivalists who are able to walk naked into the wilderness and obtain all food, shelter, and tools strictly from what they find there, and we are eager to learn from them. But very few, if any, survivalists live that way all the time. Most do it for a couple of weeks and then return to their city boats. While most of our tools and supplies still come from that society, we spend little time there including time spent earning money to buy supplies, much less time than most survivalists. Gradually, we are increasing our foraging abilities and reducing our use of imports, but always striving for maximum vanu with comfort overall. All our essential imports are storable for a year or more, so in an event of some catastrophe, we will have additional time to learn uh, to do without." Uh, end quote. So, so yeah, he... I. So yeah, when it comes to you know survivalists, Ray, uh, survivalists, and I guess uh, you know kind of the the retreatists in general, uh, you know the folks who uh, you know are going to live their conventional lifestyles until they need them, right? Until they need to go out to their bug out location. Um, I, I really like that Ray makes that distinction so often because, you know, uh, you know folks that aren't really familiar with Fawny would probably just consider him you know survivalist or kind of one of the uh, the doom porn folks, uh, which just which just isn't true. Uh, obviously, there's a lot that, like he's, as he said, there's a lot he could learn from survivalists. But, uh, but yeah, survivalists aren't as hardcore as Rayo. Even though uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen some of the, um, some people's like a survival, uh, you know, bug out locations and all of their, all of their neat toys that they'll have whenever, uh, whenever you know what, uh, 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 shit hits the fan. Uh, but uh, it's not really what, we, what Rayo's going for here. Oh, absolutely not. What what Rayo was going for is a lifestyle. Right, what what the preppers and survivalists are going for is not a lifestyle. They're going for uh, a short term, um, a short term solution to a, a shit hit the fan scenario. What what Rail wanted was not to, not to not to not to not to necessarily prepare for a shit hit the fan scenario, but to live this lifestyle to live as as free as possible to to be as limited um to coercion as possible right it's it's not like Rayo didn't have a bug out bag you know it, his yeah. his his bug out bag quote unquote bug out bag was his everyday supplies it, it's it's what he lived yeah it's what it's what he lived on yeah it wasn't they weren't put aside for uh, I mean, yeah, there, there, some of them are put away for, for, you know, future times, but, you know, that's what he, uh, you know, he actually utilized his, his storable foods. Uh, whereas a lot of, uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, so last week's episode, it might have been on a different podcast, but, uh, you know, the, the credit cards, the credit card preppers and survivalists, well, they'll, they'll buy like a, a, you know, two year supply of food, throw it in their closet and never do anything with it. Uh, Rayo used his, uh, you know, food storage. He did. Uh, and obviously with, uh, you know, good prepping, uh, there was a uh, rotation, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, and and all that stuff. So, 
Uh, so yeah, definitely a distinction there. I'm, I'm really happy that he, he points it out over and over again. It's, it's worth uh, reemphasizing. So uh, quote, uh, let's uh, get back into this here. Quote, environment, the immediate area is moderately secluded, a mile or more from the nearest settlement. Some land is unowned, some is private, but little used. During summer, an average of two vehicles per day pass through on a dirt road. And there are a few unofficial picnic spots along this road that are occasionally occupied on weekends. There is little evidence of people away from the road and Major Creek. Within one day hiking distance are many square miles of much more secluded land. In the creeks, there is at least one nice swimming hole, many places deep enough to take a bath or cool off. Within a 100 mile radius, there are elevations from sea level to over 8,000 feet. Areas of heavy timber, areas of scrub timber and brush, old mines and placers, rainforest, semi-desert. During June through September, the weather is mostly hot and sunny. However, the rare rainy spells can last a week or longer, so anyone not limited by weight might bring a rain suit. There are a few mosquitoes in spring. Small biting flies spring through fall, but not in large quantity in most areas. There is poison oak in many places. For summer, we like long sleeve nylon dress shirts. Uh, fairly, fairly cool. Stops most insects. Easy to wash and dry. Doesn't mildew if left wet. I wonder if you got some of actually end quote. I wonder if you got uh, some of those shirts out of a. Uh, out of some dumpsters in Grants Pass or something. He talked about doing that in other articles. <laughs> it, it would not surprise me. He, so, he also someone, a, someone threw away their Tommy Bahama shirt. I'll snag those. <laughs> uh, he did spend a lot of time in Southern California also. So I, th there's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of that type of dressing down there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. So uh, back to it. Now we get to the uh, the actual program. You know, we'll break it down by days here. So what would you be doing on each day of Vanu Week? Well, let's find out. Quote, program. Our instruction is personalized. We will show you how and help you do whatever you want to the best of our ability. We can do this best if you let us know in advance what your interests are. A typical Vanu Week might include uh, day one. You drive or hitchhike or bus and hike to the meeting place. One of us meets you there at noon. We hike about two miles to a campsite I have already scouted. On the way, I point out features of interest, edible plants, etc. You pack any personal gear you have brought. I pack food and camp gear. We clear spot, erect tent, polyethylene A tent about 25 by 8 by 7 feet, make trail to water source, prepare bed foundation. I cook boiled whole kernel wheat and beans on a propane camp stove. There is also sprouts and or wild greens. I put food to soak for tomorrow. I leave you about 6 p.m. End quote. So that's first day of Vani week. What did you think about your first day of Vani week? Uh, it sounds like a good start. Um, I, I do want to bring up that he, that he said propane cook stove. Uh they, they live in a large wilderness area, um, lots of trees. There's like 36 different versions of conifers in the Kalamazoo Siskiyou ecoregion. Uh, but wood smokes. Okay, so by by using propane, uh, in which he would have to to go into to the, the, the quote servile society in order to change out empty tanks for for full tanks and whatnot. Uh, propane doesn't smell. Uh, it doesn't smoke, uh, and it 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 doesn't um, it doesn't it, it expose him. Right. So I, you know, that's it's it's another one of those things that I I, I almost want to say that he's using what technology is available uh, to his advantage, right? So it, in, instead of just going completely off the grid and and all that good stuff, uh, he's using what technology. Uh, exists uh, to his own advantage to to limit his coercion and it's a um, it really is a beautiful thing I mean pro propane to him would be like you know a VPN to us or something <laughs> right right uh, yeah and I, I mean I honestly too I, I you consider where he was I'm sure he would have been fine with open fires like if there was just a small open fire to cook something on I'm sure he would have been fine in most situations but his his goal was you know obviously to increase mean time to harassment. Uh, or in other words, you know, in the meantime, to discovery. So, uh, so he really didn't take that risk, which I, I understand. Uh, I definitely understand. But uh, you know, I I don't know. I'm sure there were times when he ran out of propane. Uh, well, maybe not. He's pretty, you know, pretty formidable guy. I'm, I'm sure he was. He got pretty good at this, you know, after 10 years. But uh, you know, I, I imagine there were some times where where he cooked over open fires. But uh, you know, uh, obviously something he probably tried to avoid at all costs, just considering the type of person oh. that he was. Oh. Uh, absolutely. You know, um, if you're cooking over a fire, you're producing smoke. Uh, and as he mentioned, uh, hearing uh, hearing the highway, hearing cars on the highway on occasion, um, where where he's at, it was a national forest, right? So there there are there are technically laws against uh, burning certain times of year due to the fire risk and and whatnot. So um, maybe maybe he burned in the winter. 
uh, and then use propane in the summer to to limit his um, his chances of of being exposed. Right. Yeah. That's 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 certainly possible. Yeah. Good good points. Good points. Uh, so day two. Let's find out about day two. Quote: Morning, you relax, read, or explore immediate area. I come at about 2 p.m., bringing remainder of food supplies and drum. We gather wild edibles in season. We grind grain for breed for bread and chapatas. Uh, how do we pronounce that? Uh, we put up fire tarp for wood stove. We wrap about food, procurement, storage, preparation. At dusk, we cook dinner on wood fire. And quote, okay, so we got, uh, yeah, so we did cook on open fire, uh, or at least uh, using a, a wood wood stove sort of thing. So, uh, so yeah, we, the 55-gallon dr drums full of food are brought up again. You know, he's going to haul, uh, you know, the, the storable foods. Uh, we, we covered that in uh, the food storage episode, uh, you know, they're set up there. But uh, but yeah, I guess they did cook over open fire. We just got uh, you know verification for that. <laughs> it didn't take Whoops. long. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> All right. So so day three, uh, you're alone to explore, forage, swim, read, relax, and think. Uh, so yeah, day three sounds pretty relaxing. Uh, it really does. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a lot of uh, actually no. I, as we talked about, there's a lot of uh, areas to explore. So uh, uh, so I, I would probably spend most of my time hiking, but that's just me. Oh, absolutely. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, it's it's an absolutely beautiful region. It is, uh, it is very rocky. Uh, lots of wildlife, lots of different fauna and flora. Uh, it's. I I wish I honestly wish I was there. <laughs> it was, it's beautiful. Right. Oh. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, day four. Quote, uh, I've, I come about 10 a.m. We camouflage tents. Uh, we bury a five-gallon can of pretended, pretended valuables. We prepare an inconspicuous trail through a heavy brush area. I show described foot gear that doesn't mar the turf. Electric fence warning systems. We wrap, up, wrap about concealment, uh, end quote. So, uh, so I, obviously, he's going to teach you how, as he says, he's going to teach you how to, you know, put, uh, you know, bury your five-gallon drums for your, your, your supply caches. And uh, uh, something else that uh, was discussed, I don't remember what episode it was, I lose track, guys, uh, but something Kyle and I talked about, uh, something that uh, Kyle pointed out was, you know, Rayo's utilization of a different footwear for a different things. So if he's right around camp, he'll use something, you know, with a soft, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, a soft bottom, like a, like a moccasin. But if he's outside the camp area, he'll wear, he'll wear like, camping boots. Uh, which is just like the the de the detail like he's very very detail oriented. A lot of the stuff that he per, like that he was doing, uh, you know, people wouldn't really even think about. They just wear their camping boots out there because they're camping, right? Um, I mean, th this is why uh, this is why Kyle and I have said that you know Rayo and, and Venuans they really did pioneer survivalism. Uh, I, I can agree with that, and uh, uh, Rayo's mindset on, on this one on on the different footwear. Um, it raises it raises eyebrows if people find a boot track off the trail. You know, it's 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 obvious to say that that rail didn't camp on the trail, right? I mean, maybe he hiked up the trail a little bit and then went off the trail up into his area. Um, but finding a boot track off the trail would raise a lot of questions, uh, raise a lot of eyebrows, and uh, uh, it would very much expose him. You know, like like I said earlier, this is a national forest. This this it is a recreational area, but there are also there are also forestry workers. There's wildlife research and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so having them go off the trail and and see a boot mark, you know, um, it's they're they're going to question it, and that that would expose uh, Rayo and Roberta to coercion. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so he, he did things very deliberately. There's a reason why he did that, and I think that was a, a very good explanation of, of, of why. Uh, so uh, uh, day five, uh, just uh, quote, you are alone. Uh, day six, uh, for, I've come about noon, general rap about Siski region, types of shelter, lifestyles, elaboration on subjects of special interest. Uh, and the, the so in this article, there's a, a end quote, there's a, an asterisk after uh, the I each time. So he clarifies and says, uh, Quote, I mean, uh, uh, I means Tom or Roberta, usually alternating. Uh, so, end quote. Uh, I mean, day six would be a fun one, you know, just get to sit there and talk with Rayo about stuff. I mean, just, I, I can't even imagine having a conversation with the guy. I really can't. <laughs> no, like, you, as, as you people and I talk. People like him don't really, I mean, like, people that at that hardcore don't really, I mean, they're, I'm sure some of them are out there, obviously. But, I mean, <laughs> there's not a lot of people like Rayo around. 
No, <laughs> absolutely not. There are not many people like Rayo around, especially. Uh, I, I, I would, I would guesstimate that back then, maybe they were a little more common. Uh, but now, like in, in 2017, absolutely not. They are few and far between, and those few are pretty much keeping to themselves. Yeah, yeah, no, kind of the, uh, uh, something that, was it, uh, Jim Stum, yeah, in, in the Ocean Freedom Notes in, in one of the uh, sections there, uh, you know, kind of this, uh, the seduction of the city lights. Uh, I think, uh, you know, ev even a lot of folks, uh, you can't even say a lot, but I'm, I'm sure there were some uh, folks pursuing similar lifestyles back then, but, you know, with, uh, you know, how comfortable technology, you know, makes people, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely is seductive, so... Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm almost positive there's 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 less folks uh, like that now than there were then. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the I I don't even want to say the the guiding principle of the okay the the guiding principle of Vanu right, which is limiting your coercion. Uh, that that idea limiting coercion that is is popular. Uh, the, uh, among the, the quote anarcho movement and, and homestead movement and all the other stuff, but to the degree with which Rayo took it, that is that is very 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 rare uh, in 2017. Indeed, yeah, yeah, it, it really is, it really is, and uh, I would say you know the especially even outside of anarchist circles, I'd say you know people you know want to reduce the amount of coercion there, uh, you know even 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 though folks in the states of all society, I mean that's why. Uh, you know, people with uh, you know small children don't uh, you know snag an apartment, uh, snag a, an apartment in a uh, really terrible part of Chicago. They want to limit that uh, limit that coercion. Um, <clears throat> they just don't apply it to government too. They don't they have controlled schizophrenia. They don't they don't uh, uh, their thinking is compartmentalized. They don't apply it to uh, every aspect of their life. So uh, so yeah, that that kind of uh, kind of explains that at least in part. So uh, this next part is groups. Oh, I'm just gonna skip that for the sake of time. He just pretty much says that uh, you know big groups don't really work uh, work too well because there tends to be a pecking order where some people just you know twiddle their thumbs. Uh, but the children's section is particularly interesting. Uh, so he says, quote, accompanied children are welcome but are sometimes a distraction for their custodians. You know best about yours. Unaccompanied children are welcome only if one, uh, <clears throat> yeah, one weaned and housebroken, two come at their wish. Three are self-responsible enough not to hurt themselves with ordinary utensils, tools, matches, etc. We will provide additional caretaking upon request of a client, for example, stay overnight with a lone child who is afraid of the night sounds, but reserve the right to reduce instruction one hour for each five hours of such caretaking. With any client, we will not, we'll only advise, not command, unless his actions endanger us or our property. For example, if a child wishes to climb a mountain for which he is not equipped and does not want one of us to accompany him, we will advise him against it, but will not stop him. We are not responsible for injuries. We will give warnings of likely dangers in the area and attempt to render first aid in event of an emergency, end quote. So I, I really didn't even consider the, the possibility of, you know, children going to Vani Week before this, but apparently they were completely okay with it, uh, which, and, and that makes more sense. You know, there, there was an article in Vani Life, March 1973, which will be released soon. Uh, will be released soon. It's, it's, everything's finished. It's got to um, wait, uh, wait on Kyle's afterward. But uh, there was an article in there teaching kids how to read the easy way or the simple way. So something along that, along that title. And I thought, I was like, you know, Rayo didn't have kids. Like, why is he writing an article about, like, why, why did he kind of develop this new way of reading? Um, well, it's probably because, you know, he, he took care of kids, you know, during Vani Week, which is a really interesting thought to think about. Yeah, uh, Ron, or Ron, Rayo, Rayo was a smart guy. You know, he, he understood that, that without the children... Uh, this lifestyle, right? That that he wanted. Um, like I, I don't, I don't see him. I don't see him. Um, uh, I don't see him excluding anybody that wants to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Rayo is is an educated person. Uh, at, it, he discussed several times about having a good conversation and how he hates the small talk and he wants to get philosophical and in depth with people. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, I don't see him excluding anybody that wants to learn. No, no, definitely not. And I guess one of the more intriguing things is it sounds like, uh, you know, uh, the custodians could say, uh, yeah, you want to go to Vani week or else I'll, I'll, I'll drop you off at the drop off spot near and Ray and Roberta's hands. Now that's like the old, like that's like free range parenting back uh, uh, back in the 70s, 
Uh, you know, you want to go, you want to go stay in the middle middle of the wilderness with two people? Uh, sure, go for it. Why not? Uh, Lenore Skinny's would be <laughs> proud. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, children going alone to Vaughn Week. I don't think that happens, and um, uh, and more evidence will come out. You know, as we get through this, there are only two groups of people. Uh, in 1972, and Ray disappeared in 1974, so I highly doubt. Uh, the, the way that he publicized Bonnie Week was by via the publications, and if he didn't write publications, there's no way anyone would know that he was still doing Bonnie Week. So uh, I imagine Bonnie Week ended in 1974, so uh, he, he said that he liked the, the, the number of people in 1972, which was two groups. Uh, so if you consider two or three more groups in 1973 and maybe one more in 1974, you're only talking about a handful of groups. So uh, I, I don't think there were any uh, uh, there were any uh, you know children there alone, but uh, obviously that's speculation. We don't we don't uh, we don't really know for sure. And on that same note, um, actually I'll say that I'll save that for a conclusionary point. But uh, anything else there before I uh, actually let me finish up this uh, children's section real quick. Uh, quote: Hazards in the immediate area are no greater than around a conventional home, perhaps less. There are rocks and a few cliffs, but no stairs or roofs. Creeks, but no streets or bathtubs. A few rattlesnakes and coyotes who usually avoid people, but no dogs or child molesters. Poison oak, but no sugar-coated pills or airplane glue. We have no children of our own, but have caretaken children from age three and up. No animals, end quote. So I guess, yeah, they, they, guess they have caretaken children from ages three and up. Interesting. So uh, anything else there? Uh, no, I, I just I wanted to say that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Rayo did spend to a lot of time in Southern California. Uh Large, the large groups of uh, of Vanuans, uh in Southern California at that time. You know, a lot of uh, quote unquote beach bums and people living in the desert and and living on uh, parking on public streets and, and all that good stuff. So it, it does not surprise me that uh, Rayo mentions taking care of kids. No, no, I mean it 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 it, it doesn't really surprise me either. But uh, it's just I, it's not something. Kids are just not something I attribute with Rayo, uh, and maybe that maybe that's my that's that's just kind of my own perception. Uh, obviously, obviously not accurate. So, um, well, it's it's so, prob it's probably because he doesn't mention having any of his own. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 probably it. That's probably it. So, uh, all right. So, to almost finished with this article. Uh, for food, quote: Unless you have special diet problems, we suggest that during Vani week you consume only food that we provide, or that you forage, discover, cure any problems you may have eating mostly grains and legumes. We also provide small quantities of storable goodies and demonstrate some cake and candy substitutes. Oh boy! Uh, getting together. The meeting place will be less than 10 miles from a paved highway on which there is at least daily bus service. An average auto can be driven to the meeting, uh, driven to the meeting place in most weather. When you send deposit, please tell us expected date and time of arrival, number of people in groups, approximate ages, means of identifying you, particular interests, special services needed. We receive mail about once a month. We have no phone. We will then send you directions to meeting place. Uh, we'll also send a duplicate to your name, uh, CO General Delivery, Grants Pass, Oregon, if we believe it is likely that you will have left home before we reply. One of us will check at meeting place from one half hour before until one half hour after the time you set for meeting, daylight hours only. If you do not arrive within a half hour after the time you set, you will be instructed to erect a flag on top of a nearby hill. We'll check every couple of days for a week or so. If I was bringing a vehicle that isn't especially attractive to vandals, uh, if I was bringing a vehicle that isn't especially attractive to vandals or valuable, I would probably leave it parked near the meeting place for the week. If you do this, the risk is yours. We will caretake a vehicle for a week or two a uh, week for two dollars plus per one dollar uh, plus one dollar per one thousand dollar value. It will not be accessible. For pickup and delivery, one small person, motorbike, person plus luggage, 150 pound max, Cave Junction, five dollars, Grants Pass or Medford Airport, fifteen dollars. Two or more people, 1500 pound max, uh, Cave Junction, ten dollars, Grants Pass or Medford Airport, thirty dollars. There is also a light plane airport between Cave Junction and O'Brien. Sorry, but at present, we cannot offer Vani Week on an apprentice basis where you pay through work done for us. Perhaps in another year, we'll have enough easily contracted out work for this to be possible, end quote. So there's our kind of references, uh, the ones we kind of alluded to earlier when you were talking about uh, the, the, the area where he lived, uh, Cave Junction. And this, this is what I did, honestly, uh, uh, Jason. So I saw those, I saw that, you know, the, uh, so obviously Cave Junction is closer to where they were since it costs less than Grants Pass or Medford Airport, right? Uh, you know, logically. So I just looked at the map and I was like, okay, so Cave Junction is $5. And I just kind of went and, and kind of assumed where he was then uh, at that point. So uh, anything there? Uh, 
<laughs> no, I, I mentioned what I had earlier uh, on the area. Uh, O'Brien uh, is also mentioned. Um, Highway 199. I mean, it goes goes east from Crescent City, takes a hard left, and goes north up into uh, uh, Grants Pass. This is this is this is extreme southern Oregon. I mean, O'Brien itself is only like 12 or 15 miles from the California border. Okay, very good. Yeah, we're actually getting some, I guess, some geography here, which uh, I think is beneficial for the listeners. But uh, okay, so the uh, the next article, program notes for Vanu Week Day One by Rayo, um, and uh, the editor's note here from uh, from Jim Stum. Quote: Roger Kenmore. Uh, supplied a copy of what appears to be lecture notes that Rayo used for his days one and four presentations during Vanu week. These notes are sketchy, but they contain uh, much valuable information. Uh, here are the notes for day one and f- uh, days one and four. So, end quote. Uh, just real quick, that means Roger Kenmore might have been one person that went to Vanu week, or else, um, you know, Rayo just sent Roger Kenmore, uh, uh, you know, the program notes for thoughts or something along those lines, which is uh, interesting. Interesting. Hold on. Was yeah, RK. Hmm. So I remember, wasn't there an acronym? Hold on, let me let me check this real quick. Because there was an RK I thought mentioned. Um, oh, RP was the acronym, so it might not, might not have been Roger Kenmore. Anyways, uh, just wanted to double check that. I like I like to uh, you know there's there's always a lot of uh, it's it's very investigative, uh, trying to figure out all these details and put them into a coherent uh, you know. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. But I checked it. Yeah, wasn't uh, doesn't look like it was Roger Kenmore. So yeah, as I mentioned as I mentioned to you. Uh, Rayo, Rayo had his own language, you know, with 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 all the the Vanuans and and Vanuites and and just like the the way he spoke, it it really was his own language. And you do have to think when you're reading his stuff, and you do have to look a lot of it up. Yes, yes, you definitely do. What I, I think that's I think that's half the fun. It's trying to it's uh, trying to figure out the mystery of Rayo, uh, which uh, oh, it's a good time. It's a good time. I assure you. Uh, so okay. So for uh, program notes day one, I'm not sure the best way to do this. Um, I would recommend, uh, again, you go download a free copy of uh, Vanu Book 2, vanupodcast.com forward slash Vanu 2. And uh, you can look at this, but I'm just going to kind of brief overview because it's uh, it's just an outline. So it's not really conducive to a podcast format. So for, for day one, uh, the first item is ground cover. Uh, so he talks about uh, heavy uncut timber, uh, clear cutting timber, uh, selectively cutting timber, uh, scrubbing timber uh, or brush lands. Uh, the second one, uh, the site checklist, uh, obviously make sure there's air cover, uh, trees, ground cover, heavy brush, uh, and access, distance from paved road, distance from any roadhead, raging rivers to cross in winter or spring, snowy ridges to cross in winter. Uh, then the alt- altitude exposure, uh, is it south facing for solar energy? Ooh, solar energy. Uh, water source, water noise, uh, slope, uh, slope would be important, wouldn't it, Jason? Uh, if uh, you're gonna for if you're going to, you know, erect some sort of vanu shelter, uh, you want to make sure it's dry inside. And uh, uh, and you mentioned that there's uh, uh, quite a bit of precipitation there, right? Uh, yeah, uh, slope would be hugely important, not only for uh, the types of plants that that you would find, the types of trees, but it would also uh, be hugely important for your own safety. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, it's it's a rocky area, um, a, a rolled ankle, and you're tumbling down the hill. You know, trees trees fall, and and with with winter, you got to worry about avalanches, and you got to worry about fires in the summer. But uh, the terrain of of the area, as I mentioned before, it's not it's not you know like Kentucky rolling hills. It's 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 mountains. It's it's up and down. It's deep valleys. It's it's high peaks. Um, the, the brush is very thick. The water is very cold. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, you don't, you don't want to camp on, on an extreme edge, you know, or on extreme, uh, steep, right? You, you want flat, but you don't want too flat because you're going to have to worry about puddling and all this other stuff. So exactly. Yeah. um, yeah, yeah, that's so you don't you don't want to be at the uh, you probably wouldn't want to be at like the like uh, if there's uh, two mountain peaks you probably wouldn't want to be like in the valley down there I imagine you'd uh, you'd get flooded out pretty quick uh, so you know very uh, you know astute observation there by Ray I'm sure I, I know there was one time in Vonnie book one he talked about uh, uh, and this may not have been from the slope but uh, he may, it might actually yeah that was that was about the camping gear uh, you know one of the tents he bought was a piece of shit 
and he wasn't very happy with it, so he built his own, or he put together his own. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I sh I'm sure he learned from experience about that one. You know, uh, waking up with uh, water uh, where you're sleeping, uh, that's not uh, fun for anybody. Uh, so, and, <laughs> and Ray was quite frank about that. I, I, got, I got a camping story I'll tell you after about about waking up on the other side of the tent. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Um, all right, so uh, number three is shelter considerations. This is what Rayof spent most of his time focusing on. Uh, one can be built on 10% to 30% slope, very desirable. Uh, concealment, uh, surface, semi-underground, completely buried uh, and concealed. He puts a question mark after that. What, uh, what's your preference? Uh, the economy, cost of materials, and the time to, uh, and the time and money, including uh, all overhead. Uh, let's see here. Uh, insulation. Uh, how warm must, uh, how warm must, how much of the shelter be on the coldest winter days? Uh, condensation. Uh, rain shelter, uh, dew shelter, shade, insects, uh, all sorts of animals. And then we get to uh, a picture here, uh, which uh, a very very interesting. It's called a, uh, it says spontane spontaneous shelters in the Great Basin, uh, contemporary pole and bark wickup, uh, northern Paiute piled sage brush encirclement. So uh, think of like a teepee only built out of bark. Uh, a very interesting, uh, interesting design there. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, a survivalism basic. They teach you that in almost any bushcraft class. Really? Okay, interesting. I, 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 I never, uh, I've never taken one of those. So uh, yeah, new to me, new to me, but yeah, it looks like a, an interesting little structure there and obviously made with native materials, which, uh, you know, would be, uh, would be good, uh, in case, uh, you know, you got to make multiples of them. You don't want to haul materials out to, uh, five different locations, uh, as Rayo did have, uh, various locations for, uh, his, uh, his base camps and Vanu shelters. So, uh, shelter techniques, let's see, uh, heating with wood is not desirable for a Vanuin for the reasons of visible smoke, smell, heat radiated. Uh, time spent cutting and transporting firewood, removal of trees, noise of firewood, uh, firewood cutting and splitting. Uh, consider instead body heats, solar heating in sunny locations, ground source heating. Uh, it stays warm up to, up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, several feet underground, even in winter. Um, and then propane convertible to methane. Uh, so yeah, ground source heating. You know, he really liked. Um, so it was probably late, uh, late, uh, late 60s where he really started to experiment with. Uh, underground dwellings, and I think that was when the Shushwap dwelling, where he kind of buried that a few feet under the ground, uh, and that eliminates your need for, you know, a, a, a fire, an open fire to keep you warm, uh, if you're just utilizing the uh, the Earth's natural uh, uh, natural internal temperature, uh, which is which is interesting. Um, wood construction, uh, it wasn't too much in favor of that for the reasons, uh, you know, just kind of uh, mentioned with the heating, uh, you know, removal of trees, noise of firewood, firewood, etc. Uh, no, noise of uh, noise of cutting that is um let's see here okay it seems to be all of the uh you know all, i guess all that we'll cover here for for the uh for the program guide for day one but let's look at uh, uh actually i'll turn it over to you for jason what, what do you think about uh, day uh you know day one of his uh of this uh kind of uh outline uh day one sounds fantastic it sounds like a, a really really great uh, introduction to the to, to the basics, right? Um, when, when we talk about survivalism, there's really uh, there's the rule of three, right? You can live uh, three hour three hours of exposure, or, or you can live <laughs> sorry, you can live uh, three minutes without air, three hours of exposure, uh, three weeks without food, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it, it sounds like he's really covering the basics here, right? Covering the exposure uh, and covering uh, the 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 shelter, right? To to keep you warm because um it, it it doesn't it doesn't matter how prepared you are if you're not able to keep yourself warm or to keep yourself dry right you know wa water will suck more water will suck the warmth out of you faster than 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 the cold air will oh yeah yeah that's 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 definitely true that's definitely true so uh, uh let's take a look at uh day four here uh so the first item is trail making uh, ground surface in this order of preference uh, creek, if rocky, and for summer use only, and not for extremely heavy loads. Uh, large rocks, no tracks. Leaf, needle debris, easy to repair. Gravel, sand, and uh, grass, soft vegetation. Uh, that was an interesting, I think that's something that Kyle and I talked about with, um, he was talking about his Eagle Scout days, um, where, 
you know, it wasn't for, you know, they, it wasn't, they, they were, they weren't trying to pre prevent, prevent trackers, but apparently the way he kind of explained it was, uh, you want to leave the, uh, leave the earth as unmolested as possible. So you walked on rocks instead of, you know, dirt and grass. Um, and that's kind of what he's referring to here only, you know, for the, uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, leaving no track. So walking on rocks rather than, uh, you know, grass or, or, or dirt. So, uh, very interesting there. Um, yeah, there's an interesting diagram here. Again, bonniepodcast.com forward slash bonnie2. Get your free copy of this book and follow along with us if you desire. Uh, but he says, do not saw what you can break. Do not break what you can bend. Do not bend what you can avoid. I spent about four hours scouting out route for each hour moving uh, or bending. Angle up and down slopes like animal tracks, except at fake-offs. So never be near end of the trail. Arrange, uh, uh, arrange uh, continuity. Uh, so for example, he has... This is going to be hard to explain, but... So you have your uh, so you you have your camp in one location. You have the access trail that goes in front, and then you have a trail for your water. Uh, but you don't end you don't end the trail at your camp. You continue it going in a different direction. So I thought that was pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, you know uh, diagram there. Uh, that's that's another one of those um, uh, uh, maintaining your invisibility. Um, if you have one trail right leading to and from it's it's easy to notice but if you have a trail that goes halfway and then each time you come back with the water or each time you go to the trail you take a different route uh then that limits the uh the impact it limits the destruction on on the forest floor it limits your tracks and it mm -hmm. helps maintain your invisibility exactly exactly that's uh, that's that's exactly right that I'm, that's what that's what he was thinking about uh, so let's see here. Uh, he goes through some precautions on hiking trails. Uh, wear giraffe clothing, but not conventional camouflage. Dark green, best color all around. Safer than gray or brown because game animals are not green. Uh, go alone or don't talk. Stop every 50 to 100 yards and listen. Also good when hunting. Uh, when aircraft hurry, move into shade and sit down if there is time. If not, sit down and freeze. Sitting person is less obviously human than standing person. Uh, walk quietly, wear soft foot gear unless on rocks. Never run to get out of sight. Do these things consistently to develop uh, correct habits, even when and where it is not necessary. Uh, go on nude hikes, weather insects permitting, to develop proper attitudes, but not near base camp. Uh, weekends are best time to move around. Better to be seen by recreationers who will assume you are, are other recreationers than by forest workers on weekdays who will wonder more about someone uh, they see. And quote. We'll just stop there for a moment. So he really did recommend you know, going on nude hikes. Uh, keep in mind, Ray was a hippie. He was part of a, kind of that counterculture '60s, and uh, <laughs> that's not I, that's, that's something that he recommended to Benjamin Best too. Uh, was uh, you know go on a nude walk. I don't remember if they actually did or not, but uh, but yeah. I, I, what do you think about that? Uh, that's a recommendation <laughs> there, Jason. Uh, I, I have I have an internal hippie in me, and I have gone on nude hikes in this area, uh, and it is absolutely fantastic, and it's a very very free. Uh, you, you feel very, very free doing it until you get poison oak, and then you never want to hike through it again. <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, I can imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah, it sounds like an interesting recommendation. Not something I've ever done. Uh, you know, maybe if I get out there, you know, maybe maybe I'll make a special trip just to go on a nude hike uh, <laughs> in the area. But uh, all right, let's see here. Access roads, uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory here. Pick one uh, which either goes somewhere, recreation spot, or which turns off main road where there is no settlements. Avoid road which depends upon, uh, which depends soon after passing last settlement. Uh, never stop along the road and remain in vehicle while consulting map, etc. Forest bludge are more likely to question someone in a stopped vehicle than to stop a moving vehicle. Uh, camouflage and deception. Uh, this is an interesting portion here. So this was, uh, this was one of the portions of uh, of day, yeah, of day of day two, I think it was, and one of the. Uh, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the program guy that he was kind of, uh, that Ray was walking us through, uh, was, uh, camouflaging and, you know, uh, camouflaging your tent. So what does he have to say about this quote? Polyethylene reflects light. So for a permanent camp, surfaces should be vertical angled toward North or horizontal. Uh, even partial shade is very desirable because shade breaks up shapes. Keep dwellings low, partially underground if soil is soft and drainage can be arranged or learn to live in a low structure. Eight foot high structure can be seen much further than eight than five foot high. Full stand-up height is needed only for a few jobs. Four and a half foot high is sufficient for sitting. So, uh, obviously, more diagrams, uh, which I think they're they're very very interesting. And uh, I, I mentioned this on a different episode of uh, of, of TVP. But for a polyethylene a tent, the, the supplies for that would be really really cheap. So, I still haven't heard from anybody on this. But 
you know, with, uh, uh, you know, next year when we get to season three and we're starting to, uh, you know, kind of uh, get into more of kind of the developing and, and kind of how do you do this today, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, construct one of these polyethylene A tents, do a tutorial video down at our property in Southern Illinois, because I think it'd be fun uh, and also kind of uh, informative too. Uh, and to, to, get, to actually get a, a you know a, a, a physical picture of, of what Ray was talking about here rather than diagrams. Absolutely, that would be that would be very very fun for you to do. Um, yes, it would. I might, I might even sleep in there one night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd sleep in it more than one night. Uh, you'd probably spend the whole time there. Probably yeah, probably yeah. <laughs> 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 okay so uh more on camouflaging here he says quote top cloth is non-reflecting takes snow load so it must be strong surface debris sprinkled on top polyethylene provides waterproofing uh so let's see if there's anything in, anything else interesting here uh you know uh, i think that'll probably do it for that section uh, unless you've got something in there you, you think is uh is, is particularly pertinent um so uh, oh, yep go ahead uh, I wanted to, to, to jump into this camouflage thing that he was talking about, uh, and 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 the height, right? A, a eight foot ten is, high, is easier to see than a five foot ten. What he's talking about is line of sight. Uh, we, you know, six feet tall uh, individuals, right? Our, our eyes are like five eight, five nine, something like that. Um, the underbrush of this area is not. It's 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 not large trees on on the underbrush. I mean, these are mostly like. Manzanita, uh, salmonberry, stickleberry, uh, the the poison oak itself, things like that. Um, they they really only get to to five or six feet tall, right? So it's it's eyesight. But if you have an eight foot tent, you're, the top of the, like the top two and a half or three feet of the tent is going to be over the the underbrush, and right. and that's 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 going to stick out in a wilderness environment. And Mother Nature does not make hard lines. And if you have a, 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 a tent, you know, an A-frame tent, a triangle tent, a, a polyethylene tent, um, Mother Nature doesn't make lines like that, and they don't, and she doesn't make colors like that. So it's, right. it's, that, that, that would stand out in a forest. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. And you know, oh, oh, another reason I'm happy I have you on is you're you're very familiar with the area, so you you can actually provide you know, well, this is why Rayo, you know, uh, you know Rayo, uh, you know, put this out there, because uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I I understand why, but I don't have uh, obviously an understanding of the uh, of the the location like uh, like you do. So uh, uh, that's you know great for the listeners too. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a little shocked that he hasn't mentioned the the caves. Uh, the the, Are the there area. Caves in the area? A cave junction. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. There, there, there's a huge. There's a huge cave systems in the area. Uh, old, old lava tubes. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are a lot of caves and, and abandoned mines and, and things like that in the area that that could easily be moved into and uh, being underground, they would maintain their their temperature year round. It would be, it would be cooler in the in those summer. And it would be warmer in the winter than the outside temperatures. Right, exactly, and 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 that's actually something that John Fisher promoted as an as an idea in the, in his uh, book, The Last Frontiers on the Strange Places You Can Live Free. Was yeah, living in you know an abandoned cave. Uh, but yeah, I you've you've read the publication too, uh, and I yeah I don't I've uh, in the first Bonnie book I don't think he really ever mentions caves, which is really surprising considering he. Uh, he, he kind of, uh, you know, was very much in favor of kind of the semi-underground or underground dwelling. So, um, yeah, that's very surprising. Very surprising. I'm glad you mentioned that, too. Yeah, I, I, I Rail, Rail, I, he does mention, you know, the, the sub-underground, right, where you build your shelter into the earth uh, as, as a means of maintaining the temperature inside, outside, etc., uh, there, there's got there's got to be some reason that we're not seeing or or I don't I don't know why he wouldn't take advantage of the caves. I don't know either. I don't know either. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. We'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to ponder that one. Um, all right. So uh, if discover, this is an interesting section here. Uh, so if uh, you know Ray was in one of his uh, his Banu shelters and uh, you know he were, he was discovered, uh, what would he do? He would quote uh, you know have most important travel things in pouch so it can be put on quickly. Money, ID, knife, matches, etc. If discovery seems imminent, try to get away from camp and uh, camp with pouch, shoes, clothes, firearm. Hide when hide within range of sound. 
uh, whoever happens to be dressed uh, dressed and up should get away, not wait for others. One person at camp, other hidden with, within sound and with firearm, is a good defensive situation. Unless discovery of camp appears imminent, stay put and quiet if you hear, if you hear human noise in distance. Wandering around increases chances of discovery. Have calls for salutation, acknowledgement, all is well, locating. Uh, calls should be calls should sound like bird calls. Have other calls for warning. You are in jeopardy and help. Do not use SOS code for help unless you want to call strangers as well. Keep calls confidential. Use others when visiting friends. Use these calls as little as as little and as softly as possible. Call whenever approaching camp or meeting place. Types of calls, signals, and messages. Hoots carries much further than voice uh, enunciations. Two whistles with a little disguise, less conspicuous than voice. Three semi semi four with Morse code. Right is dot, left is dash, front is end of letter. Four lights at night. Five taps on pipe, double knock for dash. Six radio uh, dot dash is simpler, longer range than voice transmission. Seven hand pressure while holding hands, undetectable by strangers in the same room. Uh, eight position of letters in a uh, eight position of letters in a letter. Above line means dot, below line means dash, or line means uh, end of character or slant to left or right. So yeah, he's uh, end quote. He's, <laughs> you know, he was uh, very prepared for any situation. Obviously, getting discovered was what he didn't want to happen, uh, which is why he increases mean time to harassment or mean time to discovery. But uh, you know, he was obviously prepared for a situation like that if it did come about. Oh yeah, this is this is the 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 security culture that that rail was is talking about here, and it's uh, he, he does mention uh the pouch. Right, you keep money, ID, your knife, matches, etc. Right, that that was his version of of what I would call a bug out bag. Right, this this is your your grab and go and get the heck out of there. Right. Uh, he he also mentions, um, if discovery is not intimate, but you hear but you hear people, be quiet, stay there, don't don't draw attention. Right. This is this is another one of those things where he's trying to, uh, limit his coercion. Right. Try to try to stay invisible and, and limit his exposure to, to, to members of the servile society. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I find the, his implementation of security culture, I, I really enjoyed those. And, and Jeremy mentioned this last week, but uh, you know, with, with encryption, with uh, you know, uh, end to end encryption with things like signal and PGP uh, you know, it's, those are obviously great technologies, Sure. But, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of folks really do kind of forget about the, the low tech. Uh, sort of stuff like that, like uh, instead of uh, w whatever the example would be, but the, the low technology sort of, uh, uh, you know, security culture stuff is still valid. Uh, it's still you can still use it. It's still very effective. Uh, so, uh, you know, just more evidence, more evidence of that now. Uh, absolutely. K.I.S.S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, just just having the like like he, he mentioned, if you're going to call out. Make a bird sound, make an animal sound, things like that. Instead of using your voice, right? Try to try to stay as invisible as possible while letting your partner know that you're there. Um, and exactly. I, and I also I also want to bring up the like he mentioned, have a person get away and hide with a firearm ready to use it. Right? This I, I think a lot of people uh, just uh, dismiss this whole idea of Vanu and and Rayu. Uh, as just being, you know, some sort of hippie fantasy, blah, 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 blah. Well, he, he just said right there that he, he's not, he's not just some hippie, right? I mean, the, the willingness to use a firearm to protect yourself, right. um, to, to protect yourself from, from the coercion, um, it, it, like it, it this wasn't the mind of some guy that just, just was tired of society and wanted to get away from people. No, he was he was serious about his own freedom, and and he he wanted to teach people how to be free, to to limit the coercion, to limit the government's ability uh, and the servile society's ability to crack down and and to usurp his freedoms. Precisely, precisely. So, uh, uh, last portion here for the uh, <clears throat> for the program notes. And it's storage. We already talked about this, but I'll read this briefly for uh, for those who didn't listen to, I think, a two-and-a-half-hour episode on food storage, which you really need to do. Uh, quote, metal drums with banded lids are the best means I have found. Keep painted for long life. Needs, needs good gasket. Bears will destroy almost anything else if left unattended for a long time. Uh, for food, keep in shade short-term or in a trench long-term. 
Uh, so there are diagrams here for uh, how you would uh, go about doing that. Uh, he says for cooling short term, uh, for example, large animal, put in stream, uh, trickle water over rag over top with hose siphoning from upstream. Uh, for long term food storage, also use a plastic drum liner, put in CO2 before sealing. If you use dry ice as a source of CO2, leave seals loose until it evaporates, then tighten. Uh, use at least a half ounce dry ice per gallon. Also add desiccants for stores that are not deteriorated by heat. Stash drums in bushes and small groups. So, end quote. Uh, so, Jason, uh, with your kind of survivalist kind of angle here, uh, what do you think of his food storage setup? Uh, I absolutely love his his food storage setup. Uh, that second part right there, he was talking about the oxygen absorbers and the decacent. Uh, decacent. Uh, what he's talking about is is a primitive version of vacuum sealing, right? The the if if you 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 seal up the bag, you put these oxygen oxygen absorbers in there, uh, which is really just iron oxide. Uh, it it sucks up the oxygen. If there's no oxygen in the environment, then there's nothing uh, in insect or, or biological wise that can really uh, exist in an oxygen free environment. Uh, the other idea of for short term putting it in a creek, that is that goes back to the to the Native Americans. I mean that's that's an old 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 Indian trick. That goes um, that goes back to Nick Hazelton when he was living in his van down by the creek. <laughs> Oh, yak boy. I still haven't talked to him. <laughs> uh, uh, but that, that is a fantastic idea, too. But it's, you also have to be careful with that because uh, in this area where, where Rayo was at, there's a lot of bears. Uh, there are mountain lions. Uh, there are pre other predatory animals. Uh, and I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if at that point in time, but I know now, now they're, they're the wolves, wolves, wolves have been reintroduced to the area there are packs of wolves in this area so so we kind of so even if you know even if uh you know he wasn't you know willing to uh which which he was he's talked about that uh, you know plenty of times before uh even if he wasn't you know prepared to uh you know uh you know inflict you know deadly harm upon somebody uh you know you know in defense of his per person and property uh he would you definitely need farms if you're out there uh, in the siskiyou region there's a lot of uh a lot of animals that could tear you up. Yes, black bears. Black bears hurt more people per year than grizzly bears. Huh. Okay. Well, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, all right. So that concludes the uh, the Vani program. Got uh, one more thing here. Let me just double check. Yeah. So this this will be the uh, the last uh, the last article we read. It's a it's a particularly short one. Uh, it's called uh, Vani Week Results by Rayo. Quote. Two groups of two people each came during 1972 about what we had hoped for, many more, and we would not have had time for other things we wished to do. Both groups lived during their stays in tents, rigged out, rigged out of polyethylene film, within fairly secluded, though not especially remote, wooded mountainous areas. With one group, we erected the shelter on the first day. The other group used a shelter already in place, but later put up a small, sta a small stash tent. We supplied dried staple foods, and Roberta demonstrated many recipes which can be prepared with simple, economical, and storable ingredients. We also foraged wild foods with which we are familiar. One group, uh, one group and I cached, buried a five-gallon can of uh, simulated valuables. There were many long wraps. On days when they were uh, alone, they explored the surrounding land, swam, and read. Some who came were more knowledgeable in some areas than we, which we ex expected and happily admitted. In general, our clients were well satisfied, although we felt that some portions of our program were marginal. One criticism was that Ray relied too heavily, too heavily on words with some subjects. Psychodrama was suggested as an alternative. Another was that we did not check out a clients' knowledge of conventional survival skills, such as orienteering. Our present plans for 1973 are to offer custom services on demand, give demonstrations, set up shelters, supply caches, uh, consult in a secluded setting. Our rates are very low for services which do not require travel into that society. We are still rather inexperienced, though we know of no Vanuan who is experienced. Now that, we are of, now that we are solving shelter problems, we can devote more effort to communication. We have tentative plans to live in a visitation area suitable for both, squ uh, both for vehicle squatting and backpack camping during one month of summer, most likely early summer, where we can meet people within a day or so without advance notice. End quote. <clears throat> so... I mean, in brief, it's just he kind of you know laid out, uh, you know, the the, the results of uh, Vani Week, uh, the couple of uh, couple of groups from uh, 1973, and I forgot to mention this, but this is uh, reprinted from Pack Script number one, uh, March 25th, 1970, or, yeah, 1973. 
And Pack Script was a one uh, a one issue publication. And uh, at least yeah, that's that's all that Jim Stum was able to find. He had all of this stuff. No one really knew of any other uh, edition of Pack Script. But uh, this was a publication uh, that was not for the public's eyes. He you know put it together and then sent it to you know various correspondents that he intended to send it to. So um, interesting. You know that's uh, that's what he that's the 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 Vonnie Week results uh, for our, uh, for March 1973. So uh, any thoughts there? Uh, I, I think I think having having the two groups, uh, Rayu mentioned that if they had more than that, that they would not have time for other things that they need. Um, li living in in the wilderness as as they were, right? Uh, uh, a lot of the foods in the area, a lot of the fruits, a lot of the berries are very seasonal, and there there are small windows of which they are uh, ripe for picking. So having if if he spent all his time teaching, he wouldn't have the they wouldn't have the time to to forage and, and harvest these the the foods that they needed to sustain them through the winter. Um, in addition to that, having the two groups right, he, he said he said on a one day we did this uh, with one group, and on on the second group um, we did something else or whatever. Uh, it it also shows the the versatility. Uh, of of what rail was teaching is that they it wasn't it wasn't like a classroom scene like they weren't flipping through a book right this was this was very very personalized to the people in the group uh, and to the collective knowledge of the members of the group um, and I think again that that uh, that is, is attributed to rail's intelligence. Um, and and his his willingness to show people this lifestyle uh, that he was living. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, beyond just uh, you know uh, food foraging, I mean, there's a uh, there are a lot of things that uh, I guess something to consider too is when you're doing wilderness bonding or any sort of you know off grid off grid uh, you know living. Uh, it's not just as easy. It, it, it's, it's not as, it doesn't just take, you know, half hour, an hour to go to the grocery store, uh, or things like that. Like these are things that require, you know, pretty much constant attention to survive. Uh, so just having, you know, uh, just so cutting two weeks out of their normal, uh, I guess, uh, lifestyle for Vaughn week, uh, that's pr probably, you know, particularly, uh, you know, significant. So, uh, I think that's, that's something to kind of keep in mind too. This, this you know, this, this lifestyle is not easy. Uh, if it were easy, you know, a lot of people would do it. It's, it's not easy. Uh, and especially when you, you look at how comfortable people are with, uh, with, you know, you know, technology and, and various amenities, you know, I've gotten com comfortable with them too. I'm not excluded here. Uh, you know, that's a pretty radical change. Uh, so even after 10 years of experience, it still takes a lot of time. It's, it's still, you still got to grind for that Vonnie, for that, uh, wilderness Vonnie lifestyle. Uh, ab absolutely. They, they weren't, they weren't, you know, to, to use a modern day word, they weren't glamping, right? I mean, they didn't have the big three room tent, right? They didn't have an outhouse. They didn't have a shower that you could pump quarters into. Uh, this wasn't an, an organized campground, right? I mean, they, they lived in the wilderness. Everything that they had had to be packed in. Everything, all of their trash, whatever trash that they had, uh, was largely repurposed, um, or or I, I believe uh, uh, burnt, right to right, to yeah. to uh, uh, limit the possibility of somebody finding it. Um, a lot of and they, and they wouldn't have, and they wouldn't have littered just based off of principle too. There was an article in Vani Life. It was talking about ecology and, and, and like ecology and uh, and things like that. Like they they. they uh, you know, beyond just, you know, trying not to leave tracks for them to become vulnerable, it was also the fact that, you know, they were, like, they, they kind of saw themselves as caretakers of the earth. Uh, so why would you, you know, why, why would you litter? I'm sure they just burnt it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's also uh, an idea, or not an idea, there's, there's a saying that says, um, um, there, there's people that, that try to, uh, try to conquer mother nature and people that try to live with mother nature right the people that try to conquer mother nature try to um manipulate mother nature in in a way that that they can that they feel that they can thrive right i mean these are the people that build houses and and skyscrapers and live in the city and whatnot and the people that live with mother nature they they go with the seasons right as, as i mentioned like 
these berries that they were picking, they're seasonal, right? Different berries come in at different times of the year. Uh, and if that if they weren't there to pick them at when they were ripe, they missed out. I mean, this, it, they 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 weren't just running to the store and picking up a box of raisins. You know, yeah. they they weren't they weren't you know oh you know oh we missed out on the blackberries let's go pick up some McDonald's. No, that they, they weren't <laughs> doing that. You know, they were they were very much in tune or trying to live in tune with Mother Nature, and in a way that kept them far from servile society and kept them kept them from needing to rely on 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 technology on the on on mass manufacturing and and you know prepared foods and all this good stuff like they weren't you would never like you would never see rail at mcdonald's it's, it's just the way it is you know <laughs> they uh, uh um, uh, the food preparation that you talked about earlier, uh, I edited that, and and like they were talking about importing twenty pounds of brown rice or or white rice or uh, whole kernels, a uh, whole kernel wheat or whole kernel corn, and cracking their own wheat, you know, and and milling their own corn uh, to to make to make these foods, right? And and to buy dried beans. I mean, these weren't beans in a can; they were buying dried beans that that have to soak for like eight hours. Before they right. cook, you know this. They, they they weren't living out of the back of their vehicle, is what I'm saying. They they weren't living out of ice chests with with prepared foods. These people mm -hmm. were li these people were living with Mother Nature in a way that allowed them to not only exist, to not only not only survive, but allowed them to thrive uh, in in an area that allowed them the the protection and and the ambiguity and the the ability to be invisible to the to the survival society that they were trying to avoid. Exactly, and well said. Yeah, that's 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 exactly right. Yeah, they they were uh they were they were definitely uh I don't you know if, if Ray was alive now uh you know and he's like oh you're talking me back about, talking about me back in 1972 thriving no but if you look at uh you know all of the progress they made and 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 their developments on shelter and then beyond even like when he disappeared we don't really know uh you know what you know what what kind of developments they made but obviously. Uh, the goal was to get better at what they were doing, and I can only imagine that, uh, you know, they got uh, very, very proficient uh, at uh, at what they did. Uh, so, so yeah, I think you're you're definitely right uh, on that note. I've got, I guess, one conclusionary point here that I thought of, and I was going to mention this earlier, but uh, I made the the comment last week that I wish we could get, you know, an objective analysis of Vanu Week, uh, or if people just, you know, visiting Rayo. Uh, so Benjamin Best, I mentioned this before, he was too transfixed on trying to sleep with a woman he was with. Uh, so you, you can't really <laughs> verify the. you can't really take all of it at face value, I guess is one way to put it. And then Jim Stum's visit talks about him already. Uh, it wasn't Vani week, but there was, uh, there were a lot of issues with that. So I'm not going to, you know, rehash all of those, but <clears throat> you know, as, as we already discussed, there were only two groups in 1972 and probably like probably two or three more in 1973. And then maybe one in 1974 before he disappeared. Uh, so maybe there are only a handful of groups for Vani week. So, um, there really may not be that many other Vanu uh, Vani Week participants, so this might be the best that we have. Although you know it's better than nothing, but uh, you know I wish we could get uh, kind of more, a more objective analysis uh, of, of someone's experiences at Vani Week. But uh, looks like we might be uh, uh, SOL there. Uh, but you know can't complain. You really can't complain, right? Oh no, uh, just to, just to have the little bit that we have is is huge, right? I mean we have the book and we have. Uh, March 1973, uh, and then book two, like book two, I, we found on a whim, like I just happened to be on eBay and, and found the link, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, just like, there's not a lot of information out there and the little bit that we have, uh, is, is literally invaluable to people that, that want to live this way. Um, and it's just, it's it's like it's like a it's like a giant puzzle and we're just trying to we're just trying to put the pieces together in a way that makes sense. Right, right, and and that that batch of publications that uh, you you sent to me, I mean this is uh, you know obviously a lot of Rayo's focus is on wilderness Vanu, but I mean there's uh, you know self liberation notes uh, which was uh, and and ocean freedom notes which are both published by Jim Stum, uh, going mobile is by Rayo. So I mean with with these publications, I mean you have the uh, kind of the van nomadism sort of aspect. Uh, then just mobility more generally, and you have self-liberation, 
uh, which I have yet to read. I've kind of looked through it to see, you know, if Rayo had any articles in there. Uh, but there seems to be, you know, a, some some other strategies proposed that Rayo wouldn't have liked too much because they're more, uh, they kind of relied upon uh, so-called private property. Um, so he he wasn't too too big of a fan of those. But there's there's a lot of a lot of uh, you know, lifestyle strategies in these publications uh, that aren't strictly reserved to uh, wilderness fauna. So I think that's important too. And, you know, Ocean Freedom Notes just it's it's blowing my mind. Uh, it really is. It really is. And uh, I finished digitizing that today. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know, even if it's not, uh, you know, finding freedom on the open ocean. I mean, there are a lot of uninhabited ocean islands that uh, could fare very well for uh, for Vanuans who, who want to, uh, you know, kind of live that lifestyle. And plus, uh, that, that publication was 1984 to 1990, and there was a lot of talk about technology and, uh, you know, like uh, desalination, you know, uh, um, rigs that you could build, you know, from uh, not using native materials, but, uh, you know, very easily. Uh, there's a lot of talk about hydroelectric. Uh, just a bunch of stuff, you know, the, the technology would be would be so much better now. Uh, so if someone is really, really serious about freedom and they want to, you know, pursue something like that, uh, you know, keep a lookout for Ocean Freedom Notes uh, specifically because there's a lot of, it's, it's a gold mine. It really is a gold mine. Oh, absolutely. Like just, just basic, basic needs that you would have on, on, on the boat, like solar. Solar pan. You can buy solar panels on on Amazon now. You can buy them literally anywhere for very very inexpensive. Like Goal Zero, uh, Goal Zero is, is a company that sells like solar panel, battery, and a converter. And it's like I think it's like six hundred bucks or something like that. But um, the desalinization and just like the, with the technology that we have now and the availability of the technology that we have now. Um, Doing something like Ocean Ocean, Open Ocean, or or doing something like, like Wilderness Vanu, um, it's a very, very real possibility that someone could live it in, in the way, in, in the spirit of Rayo. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's a good point to leave it on. I mean, uh, technology is, uh, Rayo did this when technology was uh, was definitely not as advanced. Uh, so uh, for, for uh, Freedom Pioneers and Venuas nowadays, uh, you have it much easier. You have it much easier. So anything else for listeners, Jason? Uh, no, I just want to say again, uh, thank you for all you do. And uh, thank you for finding this and thank you for bringing it to a more public eye. Um, and it's just, I'm so, I'm so fascinated by it, man. I'm just it, like Ray. If I could sit down and have a beer with Rayo right now and die tomorrow, I would be, I would die a happy man. Right. I, I, I've said, I've said similar things too, or I've thought similar things at least. Yeah. You know, like I, it, it, would, it would just be such a fascinating conversation. But uh, but anyways, th thanks so much for coming on, Jason. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Great to finally, uh, you know, get to chat with you. Uh, and also, you know, thank you for uh, all the help you're, uh, you're doing behind the scenes for us. <laughs> it's my pleasure, man, honestly. All right. Well, very good. That was uh, Jason Booth. Uh, so if you haven't already, make sure to uh, pick up the pick up the full publication. Uh, you know, we, we pulled articles from today. Vanu, the search for personal freedom, number two, letters from Rayo. Uh, for free by by visiting vonupodcast.com forward slash vonu2 and uh and, and jason you, we we talked about this a couple nights ago like vonu the the first book uh there was a section on philosophy and a section on theory but those were all letters or those were all uh you know articles that were meant to go out to the public and uh this publication uh if you want to get really personal with rayo some stuff that you know you'll feel awkward reading you know considering the guy that rayo was uh you need to pick this up you need to pick up a free copy of it uh, at vonupodcast.com forward slash vonu2 and, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, if you were still alive, I think I said this last, uh, in the last episode, but if he was still alive, I probably wouldn't have published it. Uh, it's, it's very, very personal, uh, in, in some spots, uh, but it really helps you get into the, get inside the mind of Rayo. Uh, what do you think there, Jason? Uh, I agree completely. The, the first book was very, uh, uh, almost, almost textbookish, right? It was, it was a step-by-step -step how to, this is the way you do this, this is the way you do that, uh, definitions of words, things like that. Whereas as book two, it's as you said, it's it's very personal, and you do, you do learn some things about Rayo that you, you wouldn't at all at all consider after reading the first book. Um, you you very you very much get into the mind of the man, um, just just an everyday guy, like he he was just an he was just an everyday guy, like just wanted to be free. Exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, in tonight's episode, we, we, we really just scratched the surface. Uh, there's so much more to dig into. Hopefully, Kyle will be back next week 
Uh, I really hope so, but uh, not really not really sure there. But regardless, there's so much material to cover uh, with uh, with all the articles, uh, you know, from Bonnie Book Two, but also Bonnie Life March 1973. Uh, that should be released soon. Uh, and keep keep this in mind too. This one's triple the size of uh, Bonnie Book Two. Uh, about 80,000 words. So if you want to talk about, uh, you know, running out of material anytime soon, you know, no, we're not going to have that conversation. It's not going to happen. So uh, thanks so much for tuning in, guys, and we'll talk to you next week.